Thank you for joining us today to spend a little time talking about supply chain management. More and more, we're seeing effective supply chain execution as a really major differentiator of performance. Um, today, we're continuing our multi-part consulting video series on operational matters important to manufacturing and distribution businesses. Um, as you can see on the slide here, there have been some interesting topics covered so far, so I encourage you to check those videos out. My name is Jennifer Goodman, and I'm a principal at Elliott Davis in our Chattanooga, Tennessee location, and I'm lucky to be joined by our subject matter expert, Billy Carberry, from our management consulting practice area. Billy has spent his entire career prior to Elliott Davis working in the supply chain area, and I'm really glad he could join us today to talk about some new trends and imperatives in supply chain management. Billy, could you uh, tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. Uh, hi, Jennifer. Uh, thanks for that. I appreciate it. It's uh, great to have a chance to talk with you about this topic today. Uh, for starters, my name is Billy Carberry, and I'm a senior manager in our management consulting practice here at Elliott Davis, and I'm based in our Charlotte office. Uh, prior to joining the firm, uh, I served in operational leadership positions at Apple and at United Technologies. And then today in our practice at the firm, one of the areas I focus on is helping our customers uh, navigate operational transformations and then craft effective strategies to ensure operational success, um, of which you know supply chain is one of those key key focus areas. And I think you're absolutely right on this topic, um, topic of supply chain as an organizational capability area that's re uh, really seeing a lot of renewed focus and attention from, from executives. Um, not only in the wake of COVID-19, but I'd say that, you know, that this focus really began in earnest back in 2018, 2019 with the beginning of the, the China tariffs. So for those of us who pay close attention to supply chain trends, you know, we've been watching with uh, very careful eyes to see how leaders are changing course and, and preparing for um, more volatile trade in the future and recognizing that the supply chain playbook now probably looks a lot different than it did just years before. Absolutely. I've really seen companies having to shift priorities fairly significant to uh, significantly to address near term critical issues. And I'm actually really thinking about one of my chemical manufacturing customers. Um, they've been extremely focused in on R&D and top line growth due to a new plant opening and they had some excess capacity there. So I actually called the owner uh, recently in April and said, you know, how are sales performing? Because I was really expecting to hear that sales were possibly a little sluggish. And he actually said sales were up, uh, which was great news. And new customers were calling him every week. Um, and I was, you know, really excited to hear that news until he told me about the high probability of the company um, being critically low on raw materials that were actually sourced from Asia and India. So big challenge there, Billy. You know, what are some of the things that you would advise companies do to kind of boost, I guess, the durability, you would say, of their supply chains so that companies can kind of be prepared for these challenges? Absolutely. I, I think the the uh, example that you just discussed is a, actually a really common scenario that we're seeing play out. Um, you know, unfortunately, COVID-19 really exposed nearly every weakness in previously tested and proven supply chain strategies. Um, and while we might never really be able to fully prepare for events like that in the future, um, you know, we, uh, we really recognize now, especially in the wake of COVID, in the wake of tariffs, that leaders are really forced to reckon with a new supply chain calculus and new playbook. And, so, you know, where do we expect to see these changes over the next several years in the in the supply chain domain? Um, I really think we expect to see shifts in three major areas. One, we expect to see a change in focus towards supply chain, supply side resiliency. Um, you you use the word durability. I think they're they're one and the same. Um, you know, building resiliency is a, a critical capability in supply chain execution. Second, I expect we'll see more effective management of future demand volatility, which we expect will continue. And third, you know, we, we believe that we will continue to see the emergence of procurement um, as a internal center of excellence. 
Uh, and when I think about your your client example in the menu in the um, chemical manufacturing industry, you know, there's there's definitely elements of all three of those shifts in there, and and we'll and we'll unpack that I think in pieces uh, today. Great, great. But hey, before we move on, though, I heard you mention supply side resiliency, and I just started thinking about, you know, how does the company really know if their supply chain is resilient? You know, are we looking at possibly supply chain audits or assessments becoming possibly as as commonplace as cybersecurity assessments? Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly a, gr a great way to think about it um, as an internal audit, as a stress test similar to cybersecurity. Uh, you know, resiliency for us in supply chain means ensuring that those weak spots are properly identified and strengthened um, so that ultimately, you know, they're un unlikely to impact the organization's sales and revenue when, when issues in the supply chain inevitably occur. So when it comes to building a more resilient supply chain, you know, when we say resilient, we're really talking about improvement in three major areas. You know, the first, the first step towards building a more resilient supply chain is to really invest in the time in doing a, uh, a critical uh, risk mapping exercise. And we work with clients through an assessment that evaluates supply inputs against both the risk of disruption um, and also the, the cost of the business cost to the business of that disruption. Um, and if uh, that particular part fits into that highest risk quadrant there, you know, uh, we know that's a, a good place to start and to focus our attention. And then with that targeted scope, what we can do then is really put in place concrete risk mitigation steps, such as second sourcing or resourcing, buffer stock programs, et cetera. And it's also during this step that we really believe that it's now an imperative for organizations to understand the major steps involved in the manufacturing process, uh, especially for their critical components. So for example, do we understand the product's standard and expedited lead times? Do we understand the manufacturer's cycle time? Is there extensive testing or processing involved? Do we, do we know all of the steps that are involved before the product arrives uh, you know, at our dock, at our, on our factory floor? And do we know where those steps take place geographically? And it's having this visibility that's going to leave the organization much better prepared to pull those levers uh, quickly when it's needed. The second step here is really to evaluate how to select and develop suppliers and determining which relationships are going to be critical to forge and maintain proactively. And in the case of your chemical manufacturing uh, client, Jennifer, we saw exactly this, right? We saw all of these new customers racing in to obtain new supply in the middle of a crisis. And what you want to do and where you want to be positioned as a leader is you want to make sure that your organization is in a position where those alternate arrangements are identified and those channels are established well before the crisis itself hits. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, just a quick question here on supplier selection. Um, I've heard recently the term, Billy, I think it was called regionalization, mm -hmm. and it was being kind of compared against globalization. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of thinking, should companies really be reevaluating the, the location of their supply chains? Yeah, it's it's a great question, and and by regionalization, I, you know, you're referring to the the trend of maybe pulling supply chains back closer to the the point of manufacture uh, for risk management. You know, it's a it's something where we definitely see some momentum, um, especially so in in critical, what we'll call no fail industries like uh, medical devices, medical products, in in aerospace and defense. Um, in other industries, I expect that we'll continue to see an an interest in developing. Um, you know, new supplier relationships and in, in, in new frontiers, um, Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, these are, are really popular new focus areas for cost and, and risk management. Um, but even those are, are not free of themselves, you know, free of risk. You're really also introducing a whole new set of challenges there. And I think What's probably most important here about this about this resourcing trend, um, Jennifer, is is really in that it's identifying and developing second sources of supply where the risk of the product or the volume of the product really justifies it. Um, maybe more so than just picking up and moving all together. Uh, the risks and reward of of changing a source of supply, um, you know, are significant, and it's an effort that needs to be program managed very, very carefully to avoid unintended disruptions. 
Yeah, got it, got it. A lot of factors to consider, huh? <laughs> yeah. What about the um, third step? So the third step here um, around building a resilient supply chain is, is just making sure that you have an effective process for understanding the financial health of critical nodes of the supply chain and developing a monitoring system. Um, does, does your organization have a process for understanding the financial health of your suppliers? Do you know how dependent they are on your business? Are you a healthy percentage of your business? Healthy enough that you're a valuable customer, but not so big of a percentage that uh, you're likely to introduce dependency issues? Um, when publicly available information uh, is, isn't, isn't uh, readily available, you know, think about quarterly or biannual business reviews with, with key suppliers and implementing those as a, as a really good practice to understand key changes in supplier performance um, quarter over quarter, year over year. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, you know, obviously it seems like, you know, these leaders have a tough challenge to, to deliver really on balancing continuity of supply. Um, with having the parts at, at the best price. Um, I guess what matters most though is really having the ability to capture that demand opportunity as best as possible, like in the case of my chemical manufacturing company, right? Yeah, lots lots of criteria to balance. Um, you know, you you mentioned price, uh, you know, and it's not to say that that purchase price is being jettisoned from the equation. You know, I don't think that's it at all. I think what we're seeing now is the criteria um, by which suppliers uh, are evaluated is expanding and total cost of ownership is now being more critically considered. And, and, and I think that's a, uh, a really good thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Billy, let's switch, uh, change gears here to talk a little bit about demand. Um, of course, customers are really, you know, the most critical part of our supply chain and we've seen significant fluctuations in customer demand recently, especially in light of the pandemic. Um, of course, not all the pandemic impact has been, uh, you know, negative on rev revenue. Some of it has been very positive. I actually have a customer who uh, manufactures very uh, tasty sweet treats and, and they're in high demand right now. And um, I'm, I'm going to blame them for the five pounds that I've gained during uh, during isolation. Uh, so, Billy, how can supply chain management teams really be better prepared to manage demand volatility? Absolutely. So, uh, another great question. So, getting better at, at, at managing demand side volatility uh, is really that next major shift um, that we talk about with our clients. And, and it ultimately, you know, being able to accurately project and, and manage demand is, is, is definitely going to improve service by keeping customers supplied on time in full. But even internally, it's going to help limit unnecessary inventory building, which you know, you know very well, mm -hmm. which consumes precious work and capital. Um, and even on the flip side of that, it, it's, it's going to help companies be better prepared to capture opportunistic upsides, like in the case of your uh, chemical manufacturing client. So, you know, how can companies better manage volatility as we recover from COVID, given that the macro picture is likely to stay unstable for a while? Um, you know, several steps here as well. I think first, it's important to just take the time to make sure that you have a regular checkpoint within customers to make that part of your operating cadence, to make sure that you have a way to exchange uh, intelligence, demand forecasts, and supply commitments. Um, you know, make sure to understand that must-have delivery dates and, and must-have quantities are often different than originally uh, stated demand. Uh, so, you know, the point here is really to take that proactive approach with your customers and understand their needs very, very clearly in order to, to, to protect your own operations. Um, second, I think it's really helpful to use history as a guide. Always sense check demand forecasts by customer against available uh, historicals and historical shipments if that's available to you. Um, this is a really helpful way to catch errors, manage risk, and, and also kind of make your own strategic uh, priority decisions. And then third, you know, begin evaluating alternative uh, consumers and, and end markets now if those capabilities internally exist and are available to you. Um, you know, with COVID-19, we saw the shutdown of aerospace markets. We saw the shutdown of automotive plants uh, lasting for weeks. So, you know, now is as good of a time as, an ever, as ever to focus on that diversification. And, and fourth, you know, keep a big picture view. I think it's really understand, important to 
understand macro and micro indicators of, of end customer demand here in your market and, and stay one or two steps ahead. Um, I can speak from experience that, that demand forecasts, um, you know, especially higher in the supply chain further away from the end customers are often among the last indicators to change. So, you know, it's really important to stay on a, on a front foot here uh, and stay one or two steps ahead. Um, and then, you know, I'll, I'll just kind of round that that list out with the caveat to make sure that you stay closely connected to your your customer contracts um, in, in coordination with your legal team to make sure that you have real full clarity on what you're contractually committed to support. Right, right. So really, as you've been talking, I've been, you know, thinking through some of the organizational competencies, really, that a top performing supply chain team really needs. Uh, some of those I'm kind of hearing is, for, in my mind, relates to data literacy. Um, you know, of course, big picture critical thinking is so important. Um, ability to handle complexity, for sure. And then, you know, always at the top of the list is the ability to really manage supplier and customer relationships. Yeah, it's a, it's quite a list, right? I, I, yeah. I, agree, with, I agree with you. And I think it's there's part of this that, you know, is, is kind of, you know, looking back, organizations have have typically viewed not, not to overgeneralize, but organizations have typically viewed supply chain and procurement functions as, as more transactional roles. And I think that that drastically risks underestimating the, the rapid problem solving skills and the critical capabilities, um, and the critical thinking capabilities that are that are necessary to, to to perform well in this area. Yeah, yeah. OK, so what are tell me some of the other initiatives that a company really should consider to elevate their supply chain management group to uh, really a center of excellence? Um, yeah, well, one thing I'd add, you know, right in line with our conversation about capabilities is this this third major trend that we expect to see around procurement as an emerging center of excellence. Mm -hmm. You know, as we recover from COVID, um, we're still probably going to face the prospect of a recession and it's in it, the, the imperative to control costs will remain. And oftentimes organizations can realize significant savings when they put their attention to procurement and, and look to consolidate and, or change suppliers, you know, renegotiate existing contracts, shift to alternative materials, et cetera. So um, what I'd say here is if procurement is not already a center of excellence within the company, um, you know, there, you could be leaving a lot on the table. Right. Right. Our manufacturing and distribution customers have really been dealing with a significant amount of change and complexity in the past few years. Um, I actually saw the trend of um, a war room response team um, starting to be very popular around the time that, that the tariffs and the trade agreements were, um, you know, really affecting our companies. So do you really feel like that's a, a tactic that works? Absolutely, it's something that we um, discuss with our clients a lot uh, and, and help them implement, especially in response to a uh, an incident or or even um, more often uh, management of a really critical project. So it's a great way, it's a great tool, it's a great management approach to to integrate multiple functions together effectively, especially supply chain. Um, and oftentimes what we see is leaders who've experienced that type of incident response collaboration, um, you know, will wonder why that type of integration is not part of their, uh, you know, strategic management system already in day-to-day -day operations under normal circumstances. Yeah, so I think we both can agree it's safe to say that most businesses are probably fundamentally rethinking their supply chain systems and resources. And Billy, this is a fascinating topic and one of critical importance today and in the near future too. So I really thank you for your time. Thank you, Jennifer. This was great. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the next topics in our consulting video series on operational matters that are important to manufacturing and distribution companies will be the strategic planning and quality systems transformation. So please join us for those and have a great day.